um, right after arriving from the Philippines. We, the weather was about in the 80s, <clears throat> mid-80s when we left. And um, we had to cancel our flights due to an immigration issue with my granddaughter um, who accompanied us coming back. And uh, we were lacking sleep. It was a lot of stress. It was actually a nightmare. But anyways, praise the Lord, we made it. And uh, <clears throat> I'm getting over and I believe that my voice will be just fine with God's blessing. So as we begin our topic this morning, I'd like to ask that we kneel again for a word of prayer and ask the Lord's blessing. <clears throat> Father in heaven, as we bow before you this Sabbath day, we recognize our dependence upon you <clears throat> And we ask that the Holy Spirit will guide us and be present to lead us in our study of your word. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart may be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Use me as thy servant. Bless each of us as we open your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Okay, so this afternoon, <clears throat> we will be sharing a little bit more about <clears throat> our mission work in the Philippines and uh, the amazing things that God has been pleased to do through our ministry there. So <clears throat> without further ado, we'll begin our talk now. This is entitled Heart Talk. And the reason we entitled it this, <clears throat> excuse me, is because the heart is one of the most important organs of the body. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> the heart pumps our blood throughout the entire body, and we know that heart disease is one of the most serious afflictions, in fact, the number one cause of death and sickness throughout the entire world. In fact, heart disease killed 696,962 people in 2020 alone, according to the CDC website. And cancer, we know, is number two, not only in the United States, the number two killer, but throughout the entire world as well. And of course, COVID killed, uh, this is, you know, 350,000 as of 2020. Uh, and then we have stroke, uh, and then we have Alzheimer's, chronic lower respiratory diseases, and so on. So we see that heart disease is always at the top of the list, okay? Now, we know that uh, heart disease is more common among men, people who, of course, smoke cigarettes, uh, people who are overweight or obese, people with a family history of heart disease or heart attack, and people over the age of 55. And then, reading on further, and I think I just need to adjust this a little bit, so I can see there. Okay. Heart disease, we know, is a term that is used to describe a range of conditions that can affect your uh, heart and blood vessels, which includes heart arrhythmias, which is irregular heartbeats, coronary artery disease, blocked arteries, we're gonna talk about that, and of course, heart defects. Tips for pre prevention, notice this, lifestyle changes that can prevent many cases of heart disease, such as the following. Again, quit smoking. Number two, eat a healthier what? A healthier diet. Number three, exercise at least 30 minutes per day, five days a week, and maintain a healthy weight. Very important. You know, a lot of people think that if I just eat a vegetarian diet, then I'm going to be healthy. Well, you're going to be healthier, but you're not going to be totally 100% healthy because a vegetarian diet is not enough. You need to exercise also. You need to burn what you put into your body. We're going to talk about that as we go on. Cancer again, 598,038 people died in 2020 of cancer in the United States alone. Again, uh, cancer is more common among people of a certain age, people who use tobacco and alcohol, people who are exposed to radiation and a lot of sunlight. That is, if you have animal fat in your blood, they've done studies on that. Sunlight doesn't necessarily create cancer. It only creates cancer in people who have animal fat in their bloodstream, okay? So, uh, yeah. People with chronic inflammation, people who are obese, and people with a family history of the disease are more at risk for cancer. So, heart disease is what we're talking about this morning. And as we look at the arteries, no, this normal carotid artery shows blood flowing right through the vessel, no problems, no traffic jams, no issues. But on the right, we see the damaged carotid artery with the plaque that has built up in there 
and of course the opening has become closed and that is what creates high blood pressure and if the arteries are clogged going to or from the heart we have what is called a heart attack if the arteries are clogged going to the brain then we have what is called a stroke okay and of course that plaque we know is cholesterol high cholesterol blocking those arteries will create a heart attack or a stroke and where does cholesterol come from real saturated fat cholesterol growth hormones antibiotics and E. coli comes from cows now people say well isn't it in the Bible didn't God say in the Bible that we can eat cows and and you know there are certain animals that we can eat the answer is yes but in Leviticus 3 verse 17 and we'll get to this a little further it says here God told the people that they were not to eat the fat or the blood so there was a restriction and we know that eating of animal food was an emergency situation after the flood there was no vegetation left on planet earth everything was wiped out and so God allowed the eating of the clean animals the ones that part the hoof and chew the cud for a time but we see later on as we go through Bible history God brings his people out of Egypt he rains manna from heaven he puts them back on the vegetarian diet they rebel and then as a result thousands die in a very short period of time I grew up eating this kind of food my favorite used to be the Big Mac of McDonald's I ate a lot of this uh, when I was younger and uh, let's see what's going on here so as I said I grew up eating this kind of food I was I wasn't raised a Seventh-day Adventist I wasn't raised a Christian uh, I ate a lot of more than my share of, of this kind of food and uh, we know that this is what's clogging up our arteries okay creating high blood pressure heart disease if you've eaten more than your share of, of this kind of food then you will end up in the operating room for surgery bypass surgery uh, like Mr. Phillips and I'm just gonna play this video for you you can I'll narrate it you may not be able to hear the whole audio there but we know that every year people are rushed to the hospital because of heart attack and stroke um, and <clears throat> there's a certain man in this particular vid video Mr. Phillips uh, he was scheduled for bypass surgery because he had a heart attack and Dr. Michael Clapper the anesthesiologist who was on duty that night uh, he was the one that was going to go ahead and uh, just you can just fast forward a little bit more yeah uh, he took the man's blood and uh, he couldn't believe what he saw when he took the blood of Mr. Phillips notice here on the right the blood is the, the, the blood that's in the test tube is very cloudy thick and gooey kind of like Elmer's glue or like cottage cheese very thick and sticky sticking to the sides of the tube unlike the uh, blood in the other tube from somebody else so he asked Mr. Phillips <clears throat> did you eat before you came in here tonight and he says yes I had a double cheeseburger I had french fries and I had a milkshake he said wow so he said what I was looking at is all the fat and the butter cheese and the butter fat that oozed out of his blood into the test tube and that's what I was looking at <clears throat> and so um, the next morning they took him to the operating room they opened up his chest for bypass surgery and there's his heart beating there and now the surgeon begins to pull out the cholesterol the plaque the atherosclerotic plaque that is built up inside those arteries and he begins to pull that out because this particular artery is hundred percent blocked total blockage blood can't even move through this and that's why he had a heart attack and so here we go <clears throat> yep they're pulling on it there look at that it's gross isn't it but it's total solid fat look at that it's just coming out of the artery and remember this is the number one cause of death throughout the entire world okay so that's what happens when we eat more than our share of fat and cholesterol and when it clogs up our arteries and basically sends us to the hospital so we know that this kind of food like what we have depicted here on our slides uh, this is Philippines of course uh, they love to eat the uh, the barbecued uh, fish and and chicken and everything and of course <clears throat> fish is really big there because 
We live in the Philippine Islands and there's fresh fish everywhere. Uh, even inland, they truck it in every day. And people, there's a guy that goes around on a cart and he sells fish and people love to eat fish. And a lot of people say, well, you know, when I talk to people about health, they say, well, I don't eat meat, just fish. And what that tells me is that they don't understand that fish, if you're, let's say, let's do a comparison here. This is from Neil Nedley's book, uh, Proof Positive, by the way. Uh, this is a T-bone steak at, at 3.5 ounces. It has about 79 milligrams of cholesterol in that piece of meat. But if we take herring oil or salmon oil or sardine oil, which sardines are really big in the Philippines, just 15 grams of oil has more cholesterol than a 3.5 ounce steak. Isn't that amazing? So the doctors tell you, oh, don't eat pork, don't eat meat, just fish, because it has omega-3 and omega-6, which are good, are good things, but what they don't tell you is that it has just as much, if not in some cases like sardines, more cholesterol than meat. And that's why people, even in the Philippines, who only eat fish and, and rice and some vegetables are still having high blood pressure and heart attacks. Now, we've been told that vegetables, fruits, and grains should compose our diet. Not an ounce of flesh meat should enter our stomachs. The eating of flesh is unnatural. We are to return to God's original purpose in the creation of man. So people say, well, didn't God allow the eating of meat? Yes, again. It was an emergency situation. It was a temporary plan B arrangement. It wasn't God's original plan. But as Seventh-day Adventist, God is calling us to go back to God's original purpose in the creation of man. <clears throat> you see, God is love, the Bible tells us. And because God is love, he has given to us a message of health in the Bible. And because God doesn't want us to have a heart attack, stroke, diabetes, high blood pressure, cancer, he has given that information in his holy word that we might be instructed on the best original program that he gave to us. And that's in Genesis 1 verse 29. And God said, Behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth. And every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for meat or food. And then thou shalt eat the herb of the field. You see, it was the fruits and the vegetables that God gave as the original diet. And again and again, Ellen White writes, I have been shown that God is trying to lead us back step by step to his, what design? What kind of design? To his original design that man should subsist upon the natural products of the earth. It didn't say canned and packaged products. Now, I'm not against some canned and some packaged food, but you got to read the labels because there's a lot of chemicals in that stuff. Too much sugar, too much salt. So read the labels. Know what you're eating if you're going to use something that is not a natural product of the earth in its natural state. Okay? Among those who are waiting for the coming of the Lord, meat eating will eventually be done away. Flesh will cease to form a part of their diet. We should ever keep this end in view and endeavor to work steadily toward it. Steadily toward it. I cannot think that in the practice of flesh eating, we are in harmony with the light which God has been pleased to give us. Who is it that God gave this light? Uh, he gave, it was God that gave this light to us, right? And he gave that light to us as Seventh-day Adventists to not only practice, but to also teach people not of our faith, that they might be free from disease. You know, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, Paul the Apostle says, and the very God of peace sanctify, the word sanctify means to set apart for a holy use. It means to completely cleanse, to purify, to make holy. God says he wants to sanctify you holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, meaning completely. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you see health is not just physical. It's spiritual. It's emotional. It's mental. God wants to sanctify the whole being. Not just the spiritual part or the mental faculties. But he wants us to be pure in body as well. Faithful is he that calleth you who also 
will do it. It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You cannot live a healthy lifestyle without the power and grace of Jesus Christ. Amen? Because as soon as you open the refrigerator, <gasps> it's over. Then you're eating something you shouldn't be eating. Or when you go outside and you're driving and you, and you see your favorite sign and you, <sighs> next thing you know, you're in the drive-thru and you feel guilty later on. Tea and coffee are fostering the appetite which is developing for stronger stimulants as tobacco and liquor. And we come still closer home, she writes, to the daily meals, the table spread in Christian households. Is temperance practice in all things? You know, I've been reading Spirit of Prophecy about 36 years, and, and I never read this statement. I thought I'd read everything, but I never read, I was like, wow, look at this, the daily meals. And then she says, are the reforms which are essential to health and happiness carried out there? Every true Christian will have control of his appetite and passions. Wow. Councils on Health, page 85. Very powerful statement. Notice, unless he is free from the bondage and slavery of appetite, he cannot be a true, obedient servant of Christ. Wow. It is the indulgence of appetite and passion which makes the truth of none effect upon... What are we talking about here? We're talking about the heart. You see, it is important that we practice the health message. Otherwise, the truth cannot properly affect the heart and transform the life, we are told. It is impossible. Is there any way around impossible? No, it is impossible for the spirit and power of the truth to sanctify a man, soul, body, and spirit when he is controlled by appetite and passion. Wow. You see, God gave to us a special message regarding a healthy lifestyle and diet was only one part of that lifestyle. Proper diet, the natural products of the earth, fruits, vegetables, nuts, grains, seeds, legumes. In other words, a plant-based whole foods diet is God's original program. And if we will practice this program as part of the holistic program that God gave, then we can expect God's blessing and health and soundness of mind and grace to overcome our weaknesses. You see, part of that program is exercise. I used to jog regular, but now I play pickleball. Oh, a lot of fun. I love that game. Are you familiar with pickleball? It's kind of a cross between tennis and ping pong. You got this little paddle and you hit this ball. It's a lot of cardio, great exercise. But whether it is pickleball, whether it's jogging, swimming, biking, hiking, walking, Ellen White says is the best exercise, by the way. In the morning, walking after breakfast, good exercise. And drinking water. We need to drink plenty of water. Most of us only drink three, four, five glasses of water. We need to drink at least eight. I tell people in the Philippines, at least ten. Because we sweat and sweat and sweat and sweat nonstop. Year round, pretty much. Sunshine. Great. Love the sunshine. In fact, it was cloudy and rainy in Sacramento. And when we left yesterday morning, it was still cloudy. And when we crossed over the grapevine, I was like, oh. Wow, praise the Lord. Actually, on the way down, even Fresno was nice and sunny, beautiful. Temperance, very important. What is temperance? Moderation of that which is good. Don't overeat, don't overwork, don't oversleep. Total abstinence from that which is harmful. Drugs, alcohol, caffeine, green tea, coffee. By the way, green tea has caffeine. I don't know if you knew that. I didn't know that. People say, oh, it's a great medicine. It has a lot of good medicinal properties, but it also has caffeine, so I don't use it. Self-restraint, self-control, which is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Fresh air, oh, I love it. We went hiking up in the mountains of, of uh, San Jose where they have these big redwoods, and it was just fantastic. Fresh air, very important. And rest. We need plenty of sleep. We've got to have a rest. And God gave the Sabbath day, the seventh day Sabbath, the Saturday Sabbath, 
as a day of rest, as a memorial of God's creative power to create all the amazing things that we can see in our world today. And we need rest in Jesus. And that comes through Bible study and prayer and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we also need to trust in God's divine power because without Jesus, you can do how much? A little bit? You can do something? Nothing, right? Now unto him, this is one of my favorite promises in the word of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above, notice this word above, that's like way above, above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. You see, if you're having a problem with appetite, if you're having a problem with anger, if you're having a problem with impatience and kindness, God's power is far above what you can even ask. It is unlimited. And it is ours by faith in Jesus Christ. And so the physical heart must be kept, be kept healthy through proper diet, exercise, drinking your water, getting your sunshine, your fresh air, temperance, rest, and trust in divine power, an attitude of gratitude. All of these things are necessary in order for the physical heart to be healthy. But you see, every one of us on planet Earth has what we call spiritual heart disease. What are we talking about today? The heart, right? Spiritual heart disease. You see, the Bible tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. You know, the Bible tells us the heart is wicked, desperately wicked. Why is that? Because out of the heart proceed what? Evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. Jesus said in Matthew 15, verse 19 and 20. So it is out of the heart, meaning out of the mind, that these evil things proceed forth. And that's why the Bible also says in Luke 6 45 that it is out of the abundance of the heart, or meaning the mind, that the mouth speaketh. The heart is desperately wicked, and we have spiritual heart disease. Every one of us has sinned against God. We have that spiritual heart disease. And many people, unfortunately, carry that heart disease to extremes and will even abuse other people. You see, I myself, and some of you are not familiar with my testimony, I grew up in San Diego, California, in a home with alcoholic parents. There was sexual abuse, physical abuse, verbal and emotional abuse, and I became a drug addict at a very young age. And I continued in my rebellion against God, against family, against everybody. I was a very miserable, miserable person. And here I am at 19 years old in a rock band when I was living in Italy. Uh, and rock music was my escape. Drugs was my escape. I was trying to, to stuff down the pain and the anger that I had been controlled by for so many years due to the abuse that I suffered. And you see, my religion, if you could call it that, was rock and roll. I would spend three, four, five, six hours a day playing rock music, and that was my escape from the reality that I was a very, very broken and miserable human being. At 19 years old, I overdosed on methamphetamines. I was a speed addict. They call it speed, crank, meth. And at 21, as I'm pictured in this picture here, right about that age, I was dealing drugs in Italy. My dad was in the Navy. I was living on, on, uh, in Naples. And I traveled a little bit there in Europe as well. And I was doing very, very bad things. But when I came back to the United States, because I almost got caught with a lar large amount of drugs, God spared my life again. When I came back to the United States, I was working in a warehouse, living out of my car, doing drugs, but I had 
a Bible and I was reading it, but I didn't understand it. And I was afraid of the Bible because there were beasts described in the book of Revelation. There was the number 666 and I would hide the Bible under my bed at this time, I would put it underneath the seat of my car. And when I was really desperate and down and out, I would read some scriptures and I didn't understand it. Until one day, a young man gave me a book called Steps to Christ by Ellen White. And I began to read this little book. And halfway through the book, it felt like somebody took a machete and just pierced my heart. And I was in such pain and agony emotionally. And I said, Lord, I'm done. I'm tired. I didn't know that you love me so much. Please help me. And I began to cry out for God. And as I began to read the Bible, I came across this promise in Ezekiel 36, verse 26 and 7 says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. You know, and in verse 25, the Bible says, God says, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. What does that mean? Does that mean that, that is, is that talking about like baptism with sprinkling or something? No. In fact, Paul the Apostle says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 and 6, he says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. You see, as we begin to read the word of God, as we study the promises of God, it will cleanse and purify our lives one drop at a time and another drop at a time and God will flood your soul with grace and power and love and it will completely transform your entire life. You see, we have spiritual heart disease. For me, the biggest miracle wasn't that God delivered me from drugs and alcohol in one night, overnight. That wasn't the biggest miracle. The biggest miracle was that God enabled me to forgive my dad for the abuse that I suffered for many years. That was the biggest miracle. The miracle was delivering me from an unforgiving spirit, from the anger and the bitterness and the hatred that I had towards him and others. And I know that there are many of us, maybe some in this room, maybe some who are watching online, that are struggling with the abuse of the past. If we will come to Jesus, Jesus will take your baggage and he will carry it for you. He says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Are you walking around with your baggage? Are you weighed down? He says, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. That's a learning process. It doesn't, for some people, for me, it didn't happen overnight. It took years for me to totally surrender that anger to God. We used to drive to church. Me and my wife would be arguing and arguing. And we would be so, ang I would be so angry. My wife wasn't the root of that. It was me. She was trying to reason me with me and I was being angry and angry and angry. And we would go to church and we would get out of the car and we would go to church and say, Happy Sabbath! And we'd wear our mask. And when we'd go back to the car on the way home, the argument would pick up where it left off with me, of course, as the root problem. And I didn't understand, where's all this coming from? And I struggled with this for years. Depression, anxiety, fear, anger. And one night... At 2 o'clock in the morning, I went out to go jogging because I couldn't sleep. And I was praying and I said, God, it's not fair. Why did you do this to me? I was blaming God for what happened to me. And the Lord flashed a mental picture in my mind of my dad abusing me and behind him was Satan telling him to abuse me. And now I was free because I understood emotionally 
Yes, I understood it theologically. I read the origin of evil chapter in Great Controversy, The Snares of Satan. I read the whole book several times. I understood it theologically, but emotionally, I couldn't accept it until God revealed in a very personal way that he suffered with me and was in no way responsible for what happened to me. You see, hurt people hurt people and God gives everyone freedom of choice and he will not violate that freedom of choice. And when I understood that, I was a free man. And then the Lord showed me, now you need to forgive your dad. And I had that opportunity before my dad passed away many years ago to look him in the eye and tell him, I forgive you for all that you have done to, done to me. And I have been free ever since. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And what is that? If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. And now, I'm a happy camper. Praise God. I am free. You know, Jesus said, and we just read this in our Sabbath school lesson this morning. Thank you, Brother Eugene, for sharing that wonderful lesson. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the, what? You see, I for years, since I was a little child, was broken hearted until I came to Jesus and said, Lord, I need healing. I need you. He binds up the broken hearted. He proclaims liberty to the captives. I was a slave to anger for years and vices. God delivered me from the vices first and years later, yes, years later, he delivered me from the root cause, which was the anger and resentment and hatred. And the opening of the prison to them that are bound. I'm a free man. I can talk about this as if I'm talking not about James Kirtley, as if I'm talking about somebody that's way over there. Because I'm so far disconnected emotionally from that, from the past, because I'm a free man by the grace of God. And God wants us to be free. He says, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes. You know, Satan said, oh, if you do this, if you do that, you're going to be happy. Those are ashes. It's lies. It's all lies. You know, I told my kids growing up, I says, don't bother with drugs and alcohol. You ain't missing nothing. Amen. It's empty. There's nothing in it. Those are ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. I did a lot of mourning. Sometimes I'd be driving and I would be crying and crying and my wife would say, what's the matter? And I couldn't talk sometimes for days because of depression. Because those videotapes of all the abuse were being played over and over in my mind by the devil himself. Until the Lord Jesus set me free from that prison of the devil. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they, met, that they might be called trees of righteousness the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. You see, God is all sufficient and God is all powerful. Many of us have spiritual cholesterol that is clogging up our walk with God. And we just don't understand why we always get angry or why we always have issues. You know, Paul the Apostle says in Ephesians 4 verse 31 and 2. He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another. You know, that's something that I had to learn. I didn't know how to be nice to people. Because it was all anger, bitterness, bad words, violence. That's what it was growing up. I didn't know what it was to be kind. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Amen. Is this spiritual cholesterol blocking your relationship with God today? You know, Paul says to Titus, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy. Oh boy, that's a big one, envy. Hateful and hating one another, but after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward men appeared. You know, it was the love of Jesus 
that drew me to the Savior. I said, Lord, I didn't know that you loved me so much. And when I saw that, halfway through the book Steps to Christ, while I was doing drugs and drinking alcohol at the same time, that's when I gave my life to Jesus. And I was free from those vices that night. In closing, I want to share this short vision of Ellen White. We know the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 5, verse 10, that we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And Ellen White writes, On the morning of October 23, 1879, about 2 o'clock, the Spirit of the Lord rested upon me, and I beheld scenes in the coming judgment. Language fails me in which to give an adequate description of the things which passed before me and of the effect they had upon my mind. 4 Testimonies 384. The great day of the execution of God's judgment seemed to have come. 10,000 times 10,000 were assembled before a large throne upon which was seated a person of majestic appearance. Several books were before him, and upon the covers of each was written in letters of gold, which seemed like a burning flame of fire, ledger of heaven. One of these books, containing the names of those who claimed to believe the truth, and who's that? That's us. Was then opened. Immediately I lost sight of the countless millions about the throne. And only those who were professedly children of the light and of the truth engaged my attention. <clears throat> As these persons were named one by one and their good deeds were mentioned, their countenances would light up with a holy joy that was reflected in every direction. But this did not seem to rest upon my mind with the greatest force. Another book was opened wherein were recorded the sins of those who profess the truth. Under the general heading of selfishness came every other sin. So she saw this book, which contained the sins of those who profess the truth, and under the general heading of selfishness came every other sin. She goes on and says, There were also headings over every column, and underneath these, opposite each name, were recorded in their respective columns the lesser sins. Under covetousness came falsehood, theft, robbery, fraud, and avarice. Under ambition came pride and extravagance. Jealousy stood at the head of malice, envy, and hatred. And intemperance headed a, headed a, lo, a list of fearful, I'm sorry, and intemperance headed a long list of fearful crimes such as lasciviousness, adultery, indulgence of animal passions, etc. So here she saw selfishness was the general heading and underneath that came all the other sins. In one column was covetousness beneath which was falsehood, theft, robbery, fraud, and avarice. In another column, under ambition, came pride and extravagance. And then she says, Under jealousy came malice, envy, and hatred. And intemperance li li uh, uh, led a fearful list of, uh, a, list of, a long list of fearful crimes, such as lasciviousness, adultery, and indulgence of animal passions. As I beheld, I was filled with inexpressible anguish and exclaimed, Who can be saved? Who will stand justified before God? Whose robes are spotless? Who are faultless in the sight of a pure and holy God? The names of all who professed the truth were mentioned. Some were reproved for their unbelief. Others for having been slothful servants. They had allowed others to do the work in the master's vineyard and to bear the heaviest responsibilities while they were selfishly serving their own temporal interests. Ouch. Had they cultivated the abilities God had given them, they could have been reliable burden bearers working for the interest of the master. Said the judge, 
all will be justified by their faith and judged by their works. You can read that in the book of James chapter 2, can't we? How vividly then appeared their neglect and how wise the arrangement of God in giving to every man. How many? Every man. A work to do to promote the cause and save his fellow man. Each was to demonstrate a living faith in his family and in his neighborhood by, by what? By showing kindness to the poor, sympathizing with the afflicted, engaging in missionary labor, and by aiding the cause of God with his means. But like Morose, the curse of God rested upon them for what they had not done. Wow. Wow. Now, I'm, I'm not, I didn't put the whole passage in there. Otherwise, we'd be here way too long as far as our time constraint. But then she says, They had loved that work which would bring the greatest profit in this life. And opposite their names in the ledger devoted to good works, there was a mournful blank. The words spoken to these were most solemn. You are weighed in the balances and found wanting. You have neglected spiritual responsibilities because of busy activity in temporal matters. While your very position of trust made it necessary that you should have more than human wisdom and greater than finite judgment. Remember, this is why we need a new heart. Because the whole head is sick, the Bible says. There is no soundness in it from the sole of the foot even unto the head. There is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, nor been mollified with ointment. Isaiah 1 verse 5 and 6 describing the unconverted heart. This is why. We need a new heart and a new life by faith in Jesus Christ. You know, during lockdown, and I'm going to share about this this afternoon with my wife, we're going to talk about lockdown in the Philippines a little bit and some other things that are going on there. We were able to visit all, all of our neighbors in the barangay, meaning the little village where we live. And this man had a stroke. He could barely walk. He could barely get up. Uh, he has permanent damage. But he can understand and he can talk. And we shared with this man the love of Christ. And this man broke down crying and weeping. And he said, I have lived a very wicked life. He's married. But he had many other women. He cheated on his wife. He was an alcoholic. He lived a very wicked life. And he was very, very broken man. And we were able to bring the hope of the gospel the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation to this dear soul. And you know, this is my last statement. The world is full of men and women who are carrying a heavy burden of sorrow and suffering and sin. God sends his children to reveal to them him who will take away the burden and give them rest. It is the mission of Christ's servants to help, to bless and to heal. That is my work, my wife's work, and that is our work as Seventh-day Adventist Christians in these last days. And so, um, our YouTube channel, if you want to see some of our other videos, is Restoration to Eden Ministry. Um, you can watch our mission update there. I'm not going to get into that now, but this afternoon we'll talk more about that. But I just want to close by encouraging you to remember that God has a new heart for us. God has a new spirit. He wants to put in us his spirit, the Holy Spirit. And he will restore our lives if we will allow him. So with that, um, I'm going to have a, we have a closing prayer and then I, I believe we have a break. Is that right, Pastor Harold? Okay, so uh, I'm just going to close with a short word of prayer and, uh, and then we'll take a few minutes to load the laptop with the other lecture 
and, uh, and then we'll continue our, our presentation. Father in heaven, we thank you that Jesus came to bring joy to those who mourn, that he came to set the captives free, that he came to bring us grace by which we may become a new creature in Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to surrender our baggage, all of the pain of the past, the hurt, the anger, the bitterness, the hatred, the fear, all of that, that we can find healing at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that Christ is our high priest in heaven, that his grace is sufficient for us, that our strength is made perfect in weakness, that we can glory in our infirmities or weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon us. Please help us to open our hearts to you, that we may be whole. In Jesus' name we pray.